On average, you have 30,000 thoughts per day. That's over 1,000 thoughts per hour, 16 thoughts per minute, one thought every four seconds. 95% of those thoughts repeat, and 80% of them are negative. And the negative thoughts feed your fear, your insecurity, your anxiety, and your stress. This becomes the soundtrack of your life. But there's a way to silence the negative thoughts that keep you stuck, to shift your perspective, to turn the tide in your mind. You can change what you're listening to. There are new soundtracks to discover. So I don't know how many of you have ever gotten a song stuck in your head, but depending on the song, it can be obnoxious, especially if it's uh, simply having a uh, wonderful Christmas time. That is one of the worst songs ever written, I'm just saying. The only thing worse than getting a song stuck in our head, though, is not being able to shake it and not being able to shake it. It's when we get a negative thought about ourselves stuck in our head or a self-defeating thought that we just can't seem to move past. And in January, as you just saw in January, we're gonna, we're gonna jump into a series that I think is going to be so helpful for every single one of us here right now. We're gonna talk about how to stop the negative soundtracks that get us stuck in our thoughts. We're gonna talk about mental health. We're gonna talk about depression, anxiety, fear. We're gonna talk about all the things that we have all dealt with or know someone who is dealing with it. And we're gonna discover that God can change the soundtracks of our thinking. And so consider this a personal invitation on my part uh, for you to come back in January. We would love to have you here at LCBC as we start our series Soundtracks in January. You know, it's interesting, this season, this time of year, the Christmas season, it seems to be a time when people get real reflective about the past year. You start looking back on the past year and you begin to think back on all the highlights, the memories of the past year. How many of you guys are list people? When you start a year, you make a list of things you wanna do. You make a list of things you wanna accomplish. We've got a few of you out there. You, you, had a, you have a bucket list of activities, times of things you wanna do, and, and when you get to the end of the year, you look back on that list and you see what you've done, if you were able to do some of those things. Here's my real question, though. Do any of you have a will never be on my bucket list list? You know what I mean? The things that you've just made up your mind, you don't ever need to do them and you'll be just fine in life. If you've ever, you ever seen someone do something, some sort of activity, and it looked like they were just loving it and they were having a blast, but you immediately made up your mind, you're like, nope, I don't think I need to do that ever. It might be parachuting, people jumping out of planes. You're like, don't need that. It might be swimming with dolphins. Some of you are like, what do you got against dolphins? They're so cute. No, they're not. They're wild animals, man. They are one chromosome away from being a shark. So, huh. It might be flying. It might be getting a cat. Some of you are like, I'm good. I don't need that. I'll tell you one of mine, all right? Since we're all friends, I'm gonna just share with you. One of mine is going into a cave. I don't need that. That's just not something I need to do at any point in my life. I have friends who do it. I have friends who love doing it. I've seen movies about it, and they're all having a blast forcing their bodies into spaces that no human should fit in. But I promise you, man, I'm not gonna get to the end of my days and go, man, I just wish I had been in a cave more often. <laughs> and one of the reasons for that is an experience that my friend Dan Puzz actually had. Dan is our campus pastor at our Hanover campus. Shout out Hanover. But years ago, Dan actually worked in student ministry here at the church, and we had taken our middle schoolers to a camp for a week, and one of the activities that we wanted to take the students on was a caving activity, and we needed an adult to lead them through the cave. I was not gonna be that adult. So I asked Dan, I was like, hey, have you ever been in a cave before? And he said, no. And I go, perfect, tomorrow you're gonna get to go. <laughs> you get to lead middle schoolers through a cave tomorrow. But since Dan had never been in this cave, or any cave, that afternoon, he actually went with a guide into that cave so Dan could kind of get the lay of the land and get familiar with it. Now, the guide that, that Dan went with, he had been through this cave countless times before. He knew, it, he knew it incredibly well. So they started into the cave. They were about an hour to an hour and a half into the cave when all of a sudden, the batteries in the guide's flashlight went out. No problem. Dan's got a flashlight. So he turns to Dan and he says, Dan, hand me your flashlight. I'll, take, I'll crawl up about 10 feet, then I'll turn around and I'll flash the light back and then you can catch up with me, then I'll go another 10 feet, 
flash the light back, and then we'll just keep repeating that until we get out of here. So Dan reaches out to give this guy the flashlight, and you know what happens. <laughs> and there, in the pitch black of that cave, all Dan heard was the sound of a flashlight breaking and two batteries rolling away. And they are an hour and a half into this cave and they cannot see their hands in front of their face. Guys, relax. I already told you Dan's our campus pastor. He lives. <laughs> he's fine. No, he cannot go in rooms with closed doors anymore, but he's fine. <laughs> Some of your friends are gonna be like, how was Christmas at LBC? Oh, it was great. Had a panic attack about halfway through, yeah. And you already know the reason Dan's fine today, it's because he had a guide that was with him. And his guide simply just said, Dan, been in this cave a bunch. Grab my foot, hold on, and I'm going to lead us out of here by feeling my way through the rest of the cave. And he did. He had been in that cave so many times before, he knew how to get out. You know, I said earlier that I'll never go into a cave but listen, I, I don't have to go into a cave to know what it feels like to be in a dark place in my own personal life, to have a season of my life where it feels like I'm in the dark. I've had my fair share of life where I felt confused, in the dark, afraid, stuck, disoriented in the dark, unsure how to move forward in life. There's a, there's a lot of things I think that can throw us into feeling like we're in the dark. In fact, for some of you, this last year has brought a few things along that disoriented you a little bit, scared you, that frustrated you. It felt like it threw you into the dark a little bit. The loss of a loved one. Or maybe you heard your parents say, your mom and I are getting a divorce. Or maybe you heard your spouse say, I don't know if I love you anymore. Or maybe it's when you heard the doctor say, there's nothing more we can do. It's a disappointment. Thought I'd be married by now, it hasn't happened. Thought I'd have kids by now, hasn't happened. You feel in the dark. For some of us, it's just a lack of clarity about life in general, about what our life should be about. A lack of clarity about direction and purpose for our life. We feel in the dark. It's a lack of clarity about maybe for some of us whether there's a God. And if there is a God, what is this God even like? We feel in the dark about it. For some of us, we're in the dark about why we can't seem to move past choices that we keep making that are hurting people and hurting ourselves. And we know it, we just can't move past it. By the way, it's a lot easier, isn't it, to see when someone else is in the dark than it is sometimes to see what you're, when you're in the dark? You ever found yourself watching the way that someone you cared about was living and the ways that they were hurting others and hurting themselves and you just want to shake them? You just want to say to them something like, can't you see? Isn't that interesting we would use that language? Can't you see? Can't you see you're hurting yourself? Can't you see what you're doing to your health? Can't you see the way you're affecting our marriage? Can't you see the way that you're coming off to your coworkers? Can't you see how stuck you are because of what happened to you? And you get frustrated with them because what's so clear to you isn't very clear to them. Why? Because they're in the dark. And guys, if that's true about others, it could be true about us too. It's possible for us to be in the dark for so long that we don't even see it anymore because our eyes have adjusted. And the reality is that we weren't made to live in the dark. It's actually why you cringed a little bit when you heard that flashlight go out and the lights go out. We crave light, don't we? Because light helps us orient. Light helps us make sense of things when darkness confuses us. When we feel like we're in the dark in life, we will always, I mean, this is just sort of intuitive, we will always try to find light. We'll try to make sense of our life. We'll try to make sense of it. And the best answer that many of us have been offered is that you just have to look inside yourself. Just find the light inside and to give you purpose in life, to help you navigate darkness. And so we, we do. We, we try to find some light and Light up, our, light up our life and we go to different things. And for some of us, it's, it's our stuff. 
We go, okay, we convince ourselves that just more stuff might help us make sense of light. Maybe that's the light we need to make sense of the darkness we feel every now and then. We tell ourselves that our happiness and, and our value and our meaning, it can be bought. And that the shiny new toy is finally gonna make things a little more, more clear in life. It's gonna help me make sense of things. And there's nothing wrong with great stuff. Nothing wrong with having a lot of stuff. But it's just a matter of time before the new and shiny always wears off, isn't it? And there you are, left in the dark again. Maybe it's not your stuff. Maybe for some of us, the light that we try to make sense of things in our life, it's our, it's our achievements. You know what I mean? It's our trophies. It's the accomplishments that we think are gonna give us some light in life. Help me make sense of my life. And so we work harder, we outperform, we put our hopes in the promotion, the title, making the team, the recognition, the respect. That will be what brings light to my life. And again, nothing wrong with working hard and being driven, but as many of you have discovered, there's always someone faster. There's always someone stronger. There's always something smarter. The job ends. You don't make the cut. And the light goes out. For some of us, it's relationships. And we've decided that that's gonna be what brings light to our life. Some of us have convinced ourselves that our lives will not light up until we get married, until we get a girlfriend, boyfriend, until we have kids, until our parents are happy with us. And so we spend so much energy trying to impress and make others happy, but at some point, you disappoint them. It's gonna happen. Or they disappoint you. Or they don't feel the same way that you feel, and they move on. And the light goes out. Maybe one last one that some of us have used to try to make sense of life is just religion. Maybe that sounds weird being here at church, but for some of you, you were told that what will give light and meaning to your life is, a, is, a, is religion. In fact, some of us are here today and the whole reason you walked away from faith, you're here because someone invited you or because, I don't know, you're just, you know, it's the thing you do on Christmas or whatever. But the truth is you kind of walked away from faith and God and the whole thing a long time ago because somewhere along the way, the image of God that you were handed was that God wants you to do more good things in your life and less bad things and then he'll approve of you. That's religion. And you played that game and man, it suffocated you with the burden of never knowing if you've done enough or not to earn God's favor. And that light goes out. And listen, if you wanna know what you've looked to to bring a little light to your life, just get real honest with yourself and ask this question. What are you most afraid of losing? What is it that you're most afraid of losing? Because if you lost it, you've convinced yourself that you wouldn't know how to make your way forward anymore. Guys, listen, there, there's no light that we can conjure up within us that will not burn out at some point. It's not until we have a light from outside of us shine in on us that we can finally see things for what they really are. Which is why I find it quite fitting <laughs> that it was into the darkness of night that Jesus entered into human history. You heard us read the Christmas story a little bit earlier as told from the prophet Isaiah's perspective when he said this, he said, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine for a child is born to us. A son is given to us. And 700 years after Isaiah wrote those words in anticipation of God breaking into our darkness of our world and of our lives, it happened. That son was given. And a physician in the first century named Luke decided to write it all down. He wanted to write an account of Jesus' life and as any good physician and writer would do, Luke went through the painstaking detail of research, speaking directly to the men and women who walked with Jesus and witnessed the events of his life. And it's Luke who tells us that Mary was ready to give birth to this child like no other. And in the darkness of that sacred night, 
2,000 years ago, in the most ordinary and humble of environments, the king of the world made his entry. A child was born to us. And that child grew up. And the statements that he made and the life that he lived changed the course of human history. And one of those statements that Jesus made was so remarkable that if any of us, any of us were to make this statement, we would be dismissed immediately as crazy. This is what Jesus said. He said, I am the light of the world. It's me. I am the light of the world. See, here's what makes that statement remarkable. He doesn't say, I have a light. You, you could add it to your collection. He doesn't say, I'm one of many lights. He doesn't say, I am a light. He says that the light that you and I need most, the light that we long for the most, the light that will make sense of all of our life, he goes, I'm it. Guys, I just gotta ask, what, what if that's true? What if that's true? That Jesus is the light that we need most? What if it's true that Jesus is the light that could make sense of our lives? See, we don't get to hear a statement like that and just say, well, that's inspiring. You can't hear a statement like that and just go, well, that's a nice idea. It's either true or it's not. It's either true or he's crazy. It can't just be admirable. It can't just be inspiring. It requires some sort of a response. You can either accept that or reject it, which is why Jesus makes this invitation in his very next words. This is what he says next. He says, I'm the light of the world. He says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to life. He's saying, look, if you, if you follow me, if you build your life around me, if you trust me, I will give you light that makes sense of all the darkness. You won't have to walk in darkness. Darkness about what, Jesus? First, you won't have to walk into dar in darkness about who God is. Jesus will reveal the character and nature of God. As you follow him, you'll discover what those very first followers discovered all those years ago, that no one has ever seen God until Jesus stepped in the world because now Jesus has made him known. If you wanna know who God is, do not start with your preconceived ideas about God and what that means. Run to Jesus and he will illuminate who God is. Second thing, Jesus says, you're not gonna have to walk in the darkness about God's direction and purpose for your life. Jesus will light up what you were made for. He will illuminate and reveal to you what you were made for. You were made in the image of God. And he has good plans for you in your life. No, you will not get a blueprint for every day of the rest of your life. That's not how it works. But Jesus, the light of the world, will give you enough light to see the next step. And he will give you the confidence you need to take that next step. And the last thing I would just suggest that Jesus says he'll light up, you won't have to walk in darkness about who you are. I think this is the most challenging aspect of his statement. See, light reveals what's true, doesn't it? And the more you draw into the light of Jesus, the more darkness of our own hearts gets revealed. This is why, by the way, that we can at the same exact time wanna to run to Jesus and run away from Jesus. We're attracted and we're repelled a little bit because in him, we see everything we are intended to be and we wanna to run towards that. And at the same exact time, we see how far short we fall from it. And sometimes the light of Jesus will reveal things that we don't want to see, but we're there all along, keeping us from living free. And Christmas is the history-changing event by which the Savior of the world stepped into human history to let you know, to let me know, that we don't have to walk in darkness anymore. 
Do you need direction in your life? Do you need wisdom about anything? Do you want to know God? Do you want to face the reality of your own life so that you can grow? Do you need hope today? Do you need freedom from anything today? Do you want meaning and purpose that fills your days? Do you want to make sense of life? Jesus is the light. And there is no darkness that the light of Jesus cannot overcome. And I'm so grateful for that because I know the dark places I've wandered. And I've found that for my life. And I know I'm not alone because thousands of us who make up LCBC have discovered that there is no darkness that the light of Jesus cannot overcome. And one of those stories is Cornelius' story. And I wanted you to hear from Cornelius himself about his own journey through the dark. As a, as a young boy at the age of six, I get a, a rude awakening. You know, my sister comes to my room, wakes me up to let me know that my father was just killed in a car accident. I would look around and see all the other boys playing sports with their dad or playing catch. And I would ask myself, if there's really a God, then why would he take my dad? You know, my mom was a strong black woman who worked hard every day. And if she told you how to do something, you did it. Every Sunday, my mom would make me go to church whether I wanted to or not. I had to wear you know, dress slacks, tie, shoes. We sat up front. I didn't really believe in God. I went because my mom told me I had to go. There was no, I'm not going. There's no, I'll go next time. Was what she said went, and that was just it. I remember my dad telling me that no matter what happens, always take care of your mom and your sisters. So I started doing what I needed to do, newspaper routes, cutting grass, doing things extra just to try to bring extra means of money into the house. So it was me and four of my sisters. I have two sisters with kids, and one of my sisters has a drug addiction. So I felt like I needed to help my family out the best way I can, as fast as I can. And selling drugs, it was fast money, it was easy. I would take my allowance and, you know, things I would do around the neighborhood to go buy drugs. And then once I got the drugs, I would just sell them to make sure that my family was taken care of. I just thought selling drugs was normal because I seen it every day. I seen people going back and forth to work, but I seen more drug dealers than I seen people going to work. My mom worked two jobs. My mom would work from 11 to seven and then seven to three. So my mom had no idea I was selling drugs. And uh, at 14, it was, I didn't have to fill out an application or anything. Only application I had to fill out was how much money you had, that's how, many, that's how much drugs you can buy. I played football for my middle school, I played football from my high school. I played basketball from my middle school, I played basketball from my high school. As long as I was playing sports, I was okay. But it was like when sports was over, I really wasn't. I would sell drugs to, pro to provide for my family. When it came to sports, that's the only time I ever felt peace. But that's the only time I felt connected to my dad is like when I was on a football field or basketball court. I was depressed that he wasn't there, but I felt like this is how we connected. So the one guy I ran into was like, he was like a cousin to me, but he did things differently. So he came up with this plan to rob somebody. My mind was, I'm not robbing anybody, but it was a robbery that went wrong, basically. I went back and I apologized to the people that we robbed. And then when my cousin got in trouble, he said that I'm the one who planned the robbery. So at 17, I was charged as an adult. Instead of me going to like Juvie or Glen Mills, they sent me straight to Montgomery County. I see everybody like they're twice my size. I had to fight to show them like you're not taking anything from me. That's not how it's going to be. So at 17, I'm fighting grown men. If there's a God, why is all this happening to me? I did nine months in Montgomery County, and then I came home with a five-year probation tell while I was still in high school. I went back to high school after I came home. And you know, they used my criminal record to say why I shouldn't be allowed to play sports in their school. 
I never knew that was possible. I never knew that could happen, but it did. Like everything I ever thought I could do, they wouldn't allow me to do. I went to a, a party. Everybody's drinking. Things get a little bit out of control. I end up getting in a little bit of trouble at the party. But that trouble that I, that I got myself into ended up costing me five years of my life in state prison. So now I'm back in prison and I figure this is my life. Everything just felt dark to me. And I just, and that's how I just walked through life. I just walked through life like it was just a dark cloud. So if everything's gonna be dark, I'm gonna be dark. From my early 20s on into my early 30s now, I just been in, in prison. When I was serving my last four to eight sentence, I started doing some things that, you know, I never did before because my way wasn't working. So I started reading like, you know, Proverbs and there's certain things about Proverbs that remind me of my dad growing up and remind me of my mom, watching the things that my mom went through and remember what the things that my dad told me. So when I came home, I didn't stop. I read the daily bread every day before I went to work. And I felt that you know, when I didn't read it, my day was kind of off. And then I guess upon reading the daily bread and trying to do things differently is how I met my wife. And she's just always telling me that no matter what you did in your life, there's always, you can always be better. There's something better for you. I said, there ain't nothing better for me. I said, I don't believe in anything better. She is like, believe me, there's, there's more to life than what you have seen. She had two kids. And I remember the first time I met them, we were playing and then we were just having a ball, you know. Her kids I asked me if they can call me dad because I remind them of their dad. And I know it's like not to have a dad. I said, if this is what life can be like, then it might be something better. This is when I started to change my thinking about God because he put a beautiful woman in my life and told me that things can be different. The first time I ever came to LCBC was with my wife. Just from the very first time they started singing to I say the word of the, to the to the word, it was a very comfortable feeling and I felt like this is something that I could do. LCBC made me feel like the light that God had shined on me was always there, I just didn't see it. It was me looking through my own eyes and not through the eyes of God. So I gave my life over to Jesus. I surrendered my life ever since then. Everything that happened in my past has been washed away and now I'm given a second chance at life. And now that I have a chance to have an eternal life with God, I believe it's going to, it's going to be a truly a blessing to sit with my dad one day and it's going to be a good conversation. My name is Cornelius McCray Jr. My life has been changed by Christ. So one of the things that just stood out to me in Cornelius' story is just when he said that things started to change when he finally came to the realization, my way wasn't working. All the things that he turned to in order to help bring a little light, to help make sense of his life, none of it worked. In fact, it left him in a darker place. And listen, I get that. The details of my life are different than yours, different than Cornelius's. Details of your life are different than the people that are sitting around you, but I think we all know what it feels like to realize when our way isn't working. My guess is that some of you can relate because if you were being completely honest, your way's not working. You've looked to a lot of different things to try to bring a little light to your life so you can make sense of things, but they haven't lasted. They keep fading, keep burning out. And the invitation that Jesus makes today, Christmas 2022, It's the same invitation he made all those years ago when he made that remarkable statement, I am the light of the world. So follow me. 
and you won't have to walk in darkness. You don't have to walk in darkness. You can, but you don't have to. You don't have to be confused about life. You don't have to wonder about who God is. You don't have to be afraid to move forward. You don't have to try to earn more approval, respect, money, friends, and followers in order to make sense of your life. You can, but you don't have to. And if you're tired of stumbling around in the dark and needing some light, Jesus says, if you follow me, if you stick with me, if you lay down all your other little lights that'll burn out that you've looked to in order to bring you some hope and meaning in this life, he says, I will show you the truth and the truth will set you free. And yes, there may still be dark days. Circumstances may not change. It may still feel dark at times, but in those moments, Jesus is saying, just grab hold of my foot. Just grab hold any way that you need and follow me. I know this cave and I can lead us out. He sees all the darkness lit up and the way through it even when we can't because he is the light. Cornelius said, I didn't think I could change. Too far gone, too dark, too confused, but he did. And so can you, because there is no darkness so powerful that the light of Jesus cannot break through and illuminate and bring new life. And today, Jesus is simply asking, would you, would you let me be the light of your world? Not just the light of the world. Would you let me be the light of your world? And you can choose that today. To do what Cornelius did. To surrender. To acknowledge that you want him to be the light of your world. And in just a moment, we're, we're going to sing some words that I think give voice to that. If you're wondering, what do I say? How do I acknowledge it? And I realize that for, for some of you, the whole idea, like that's kind of new to you. You've never sang to Jesus. You've never prayed to Jesus. But maybe this will be your first time because we're gonna sing the words in just a moment. Here's the words we're gonna sing. Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. You silence fear. And we're gonna sing the words in just a moment. Your name, Jesus, your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. And for some of you, just sing those words today. Mark this moment, Christmas 2022, as the moment that you responded, maybe for the very first time, to the light of Jesus. Right now, as a prayer, as a way of saying that you need the light that leads to life. Jesus is that light. And let him know, Jesus, I want you to be the light of my world. So would you stand wherever you're at, all of our rooms right now, and let's sing these words as a prayer, as a response to Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus, Jesus, you silence me. 
Christmas, Christmas is the history-changing event in which our Savior, Jesus Christ, the light of the world has come for us to bring us out of the darkness, to illuminate who God is, who we are, which means there is hope for every single one of us. I'm so glad that you decided to spend some of your Christmas with us here. If, you, if there's anything you'd like to pray about, you can go down front left of our rooms, all of our rooms. We've got people who would love to have the opportunity to pray with you. If you're online right now, you can always leave us a prayer request on the website. We'd love to pray for you. Hope to see you back next year. It's kind of weird to say that, but hope to see you back next year if we start our brand new series, Soundtracks. It's not going to be one you want to miss. Until then, may the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace.
Have a very Merry Christmas. See ya.